Welcome to the Future of Teamwork podcast. My name is Dane Grunewald, CEO of Huddle 3 Group. And today I'm pleased to be welcoming Lauren Jones. Lauren is uh, the founder of Leap Consulting. Uh, she's a podcast host of You Own the Experience and also an author of Together We Rise. Um, so uh, some great things for us to be talking about today. And Lauren, welcome onto the show. Thank you so much for having me. This is exciting. I'm really excited to be here. So thank you for having me. Me too. So I, I've bumped into you a few times in, in the busy conference schedule over the last couple of months, and I've loved watching the prominence of the book as well. But maybe for the benefit of myself and the listeners, you can give us a little bit more of your backstory, you know, what's, what's created your expertise, your passions in life and brought you to where you are today. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I have been in the industry for 25 years, um, probably in every role imaginable. I mean, I started out as a temp fresh out of school and then went on to be a recruiter and a salesperson and then lead a sales team, lead a recruiting team, lead a region, um, work for corporate, be an onsite, you know, all of those things. And, um, about a decade ago, my career took a pivot. I was running a, a really successful region, um, and I had figured out at that time how to create some efficiencies leveraging the remedial technology that we had at our fingertips back in, you know, 11, 2011, right? Yeah. Uh, I already had chat on my website, but I had a live recruiter sitting there chatting with a person, you know, and I had consolidated all my operations. I took VMS out of my retail locations, you know, and it just figured out how to create some efficiencies, both through great process, but also adding a spice of technology. And as technology got a little more sophisticated, I was tapped on the shoulder to help make some buying decisions. And that's where I built my first tech stack. Um, and when I did that, I was I became obsessed, you know, just with this idea that there was um, something that could bring, you know, be one source of truth and bring an organization together. I mean, that just fascinated me that we could have one place to go. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, and I've been driving towards this, you know, utopia that we're all driving towards this stem to stern offering that you just can plug in and, and, yeah. and, and go. Wouldn't that um, be nice? Is, wouldn't that be nice? Isn't that the dream, right? Yeah. You know, all of my, all of my names and brand and all, I just have to plug it in and then it just whoo, fires up and, you know, it fills orders. Um, yeah. You know, isn't, isn't that the dream, right? That's the utopia. Uh, but all kidding aside, I, I, you know, I really became interested, fascinated by all of these different problems to solve for. And everybody's problems in every vertical were different. And that just continues to fascinate me. And so we love to solve problems, but we solve problems. You know, I'm a technologist. And yet I still believe fundamentally that having good business processes is, is kind of where it starts. And so yeah. I built my first tech stack left that organization, went and built another one, which was probably my first like organic consulting, uh, but it wasn't consulting. I was in a full-time role, but if I go back and I think about what I, what I did, how I thought about it, how I had mapped it out, it was very much consulting. Yeah. I left that organization. I went back and then built a tech stack, you know, from a global perspective. And, and that's where I got some, you know, insight into everything that was happening globally. And then I ended up being an early casualty of COVID-19. And um, I just decided at that point that I was kind of done with corporate America. I, yeah. I don't love red tape or corporate bureaucracy. I stink at corporate politics. You know, I don't really know how to be anybody else but myself. And it's exhausting trying to be somebody that you're not. And yeah. so I just... At that point, I was at this crossroads where I was like, I want to be me. I want to be colorful. I want to, you know, I, I want to solve problems and I want to have fun doing it. And so I decided to open my own organization. And, you know, I didn't know. I opened my firm on March 2nd of 2020, you know. Um, <laughs> bold. Very bold. I had no idea what was ahead of us. I mean, we, yeah. we knew at that point that there was a pandemic happening, but I don't think that we knew that the entire world was going to be shut down for two years. And so I had, um, and that was kind of where the book started and it all sort of took off as right as the pandemic's happening. I opened my business, um, executive forum was going to be on March 9th, yep. you know? And, um, so I was like, I had 18 appointments. I mean, 
Dude, I was going to kill locked it. Locked and I was, loaded. I was locked and loaded. I was like, I'm coming in hot, right? You know, yeah, and, yeah. and then the whole world sort of shut down. And I, I probably spent all of March crying in a corner, um, you know, if, if we're being yeah. real. And because I just was like, what am I going to do? I just, the one time I did have the courage to, to open up my home business and there's a global pandemic. I mean, can you plan this stuff? And then systematically, I just kind of, you know, picked myself up my, by my bootstraps and I was like, all right, no one was hiring a chief digital transformation officer, but nope. everybody needed a fractional one. And at that time, there was this panic happening of, you know, getting technology in and finding a better way to do things. And, oh, my God, we have to digitize our onboarding process. And so there was this clamoring for expertise and so yes. our first year, once the end of April hit, I mean, it was guns a blazing. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I replaced my corporate salary my first year, signed my first million dollar deal and signed my first partnership. And then in our second wow. year, we doubled revenue, um, you know, and doubled revenue as we come into our third year here in March. I mean, we're very close to tripling where we started or where we were last year. It, it, it's kind of crazy. That's great growth. And so. Yeah, it's fantastic growth. It's terrifying. Um, so, uh, you know, it's that I always say, I think I just did a, a, a post on it, too. I wake up uh, excited and terrified. like all I, I actually all. enjoyed that post. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, there's something about having your own thing that, you know, you're growing. And now it's not my own thing. You know, we're, um, there's four of us now and uh, I have a project director. I've brought Aaron Pittman on and then we have some um, part timers that help us with <clears throat> uh, requirements and, and other small configuration projects and stuff like that. So, you know, we're growing um, and, and solving problems uh, for the industry. And those problems get more complex you know, yeah. uh, as we go. Um, but I, I f found a love for solving these problems and doing it through a combination of process and tech. And, and we're just, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. That's really cool. Um, it's a great, it's a great story. I love the, the fact in your post that you kind of shared this vulnerability to, oh, it's hard and it is terrifying, <laughs> but oh my gosh, is it rewarding? And, and the way that you framed it was like, you guys can get out there and do it. It was it was a good empowering message the way I read it. Yeah. I want people to succeed. I, and I'm, yeah. I'm mentoring a few women that are thinking about going out on their own and particularly passionate about our female leaders. We need more of those. Yeah. And, and so, you know, there are more women that I'm encouraging to do this, but I do not want to paint this picture of, you know, you can come in and it's so easy because yeah. you know, there have just been so many things that we've learned the hard way and spent too much money on. And uh, I mean, my good, uh, yeah, problems that we know we can't solve and yet we keep banging our head up against the wall, you know, and um, there are some things that, you know, require more coordination yeah. Um, but, uh, then some clients are willing to give, you know, so there are some things that we can solve and there are some things that we can't, and we got to be okay with that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, it's just learning all of those valuable lessons that takes time and it takes a little bit of, you know, gumption and grit, yeah. uh, to, to take it to the finish line. But that same executive forum is how the lady leaders came together. So ah. it was such a pivotal, pivotal event that never happened that changed so many, the trajectory of so many lives. Um, so it's, it's kind of, that is kind of cool to me. The yeah, I think I was up on a panel that SIA. So we ended up doing it digitally, but it wasn't half the experience. So how did the lady leaders combine through that particular event? So we were all getting together to celebrate Joyce Russell, who is ah. the author of her first book, Put a Cherry on Top, to up. Um, yeah. and A Life of Generosity and Leadership, I think is a full, full title, if I, my memory stands. Um, I've read it a few times. It's fantastic. Joyce is a wealth of knowledge. And we were getting together to simply, there were some of us who knew each other, some of us who were acquaintances, and some of us that didn't know, know one another at all. Yes. And, and quite frankly, if I'm being honest, we've talked about this a number of times, had that dinner happened, we probably would have gotten together for dinner, you know, kissed, kissed each other goodbye and probably- had fun. You know, had fun, not talked for another six months. 
And so we decided to do what everybody else was doing, get on Zoom, celebrate Joyce's book, uh, you know, releasing a book in a pandemic. I mean, how do we rally around this woman and, and help create some success? Uh, and so we rallied around her. We had a Zoom call. And then we're, somebody, I think, said, you know, we should have a book club. Like, this is pretty cool, getting to talk so to cool. the author. And so, you know, not to be outdone, we're like, oh, a book club where we bring the author and we'll female authors. Right. So then it became this almost, you know, we're, we're competitive women. You know, I got, we got Heather Monahan, Gay Gaddis, Erica Keswin. I mean, like we kept just one upping who <laughs> Dr. Stephanie Johnson, who, who would show up to the lady leaders. And then we ended up doing yoga together and cooking lasagna together. And we really, created this fierce bond between the 15 of us remotely. Um, and then we started, uh, the lady leaders were my first three customers. Um, wow. So it just like, we just started supporting each other, not just in like these fun ways, but in, in ways that changed my life. You know, um, you talk about that, that first account that made it for, for, you know, leap and that, that was one of the lady leaders. And so it's pretty wild to think about an event that never happened, you know, and, and then to come out of this and then the connection that we have today. I mean, these, I'd take a bullet for every one of those women. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. It's interesting. We had, uh, Eric Coriel on our show a few episodes back and he talks about accountability and teams. And he says, you're only an accountable team if you're solving problems together. Otherwise, getting together is just entertainment. What you just described there is a perfect example of had we got together in person, it would have been entertainment. We would have celebrated, had fun, had a few drinks, congratulated. But the fact that you had these problems to solve thanks to COVID, what a great team. I mean, that the 15 lady leaders of the book club like oh my goodness it sounds yes. like you're all not only built a book but you've you've reinforced and supported each other to go out and become bigger better leaders build businesses drive change on, on a much wider scale and we're really trying to help women and allies uh -huh. um you know women and allies understand uh you know, what some of the pitfalls of being a woman in leadership are today and yeah. how we solve for those. You know, we talk about topics like imposter syndrome, yes. um, and, you know, and uh, being an executive, you know, and, and I mean, there's so many things, confidence, um, yeah. all of these topics that we're tackling to help other women and, and other allies um, get better, do better, be better when you know better, yeah. um, you know, ha this, this sort of chase of continual improvement. Improvement. And, and uh, you know, we've we've been able we've had the pleasure of speaking on some pretty awesome stages this year yeah. uh, and sharing our stories. And um, it's been nothing short of awesome. Yeah, I agree. This um, this concept of allies and allyship. Can you tell me a little bit more about how you're extending that through through the book and through the club? Yeah, I mean, really, the the concept of allyship is acceptance, right? You know, yeah. I mean, we're, we're talking about equality here. Um, we're talking about representation. We're talking about like-minded goals. And we're not so far off. It's really just about awareness. Um, yeah. Now, I say we're not so far off, but let's be clear. Uh, where we are today is not acceptable. We're, Correct. At, we're, we're at 1988 with women participating in the workforce. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it'll take us close to 140 years, I think it's 136 to be specific, to find true wage equality, uh, representation, all of that, if, if we remain at this pace. Yeah. And so something's got to be, you know, that, and that's part of what we're trying to do. And part of that is educating allies on how, you know, you, men are sitting mm -hmm. at these in, in positions of power. So how do you get other women, other representation, whether uh, people of color, um, yep. all of that? How, how do you help change the face of a board where those uh, those decisions are being made and, you know, things are being influenced? And so it's about inclusivity. And yes. so, you know, allies are really just about helping you understand um, what we experience you know, whether it's inappropriate commentary mm -hmm. or, um, 
Oh my goodness. Uh, you know, a, a pay equality is a huge one, but just yeah. understanding where we've been, the hill that we have to climb. Yeah. I, I mean, I've been in a boardroom where I say one thing and it gets totally mowed over. And then the, a man will say the same thing. And somebody's like, that's a fantastic idea. Yeah. Right. And ally is somebody who's going to go, well, actually that was Lauren's idea. She said Correct. it just 10 minutes ago, right? That's an ally. Someone that's, that's going a great to, example. Yeah. Uh, the, that's going to sh- shout those things out. And so that's, that's what we're looking for is, is to inform, to educate, to help you, help you understand, you know, what your part could be, whether it's improving, you know, diversity, um, um, equity, inclusion, yep. all of those things. No, that's a great example. I love that that story of, you know, the person who stands up and says, hey, that was Lauren's idea because that's a really clear, obvious way for people to take action. Um, and it takes courage, but I think if you're intentional about it, if you go into a meeting knowing about it, it it's it's not a big step. It's not. It really no. isn't. And, you know, I, uh, Rob and I talk about this all the time because he is such an amazing ally. Um, but, you know, he's been around all of us lady leaders and we're intense. You know, and, yeah. And so he's had a master class on, um, you know, in, in, in being clear about your language and, and how you how you speak. Yeah. You know, it, it, I, I saw a really good TED Talk. Uh, in fact, I was driving back from Utah. You and I were talking about skiing in yeah. Utah earlier. Driving back from Utah and my wife and I are playing these TED Talks and it's this lady and I've, I'll I'll find a way to include her name in the post when we finally publish this episode. But she talks about the importance of gaming and coding for young girls mm-hmm. because she explains how a lot of this behavior is inherited and, and kind of enforced upon young women. Um, the way she explained it was, Coding is great for young women because the way to learn how to code is by breaking things. And yet so many young girls are encouraged to kind of be perfect or be precise from such an early age that the battle's kind of half lost when they're entering the workforce, let alone having the good allies to stand up for them once they're there. And so she said, look, coding experiences for young girls is great because it allows them to realize that they can be bold, that they can break things and still succeed. And, uh, I think that message is really important too. So if you think about the continuum, maybe there's the allyship once you're in the workplace, but what are the messaging, the micro messaging, the the behaviors that we need to be driving with our, our daughters, our nieces, you know, young, young women in schools to be starting to set that tone early as well. I, the, the foundation is confidence. There's a great book, Joanna Gaines, um, you know, you are who you were made to be, you know, um, and uh, I, I, I've bought a, a few copies of this book, um, but it, it's, it's, you know, around this hot air balloon. And, and there are these different ways that different people have of doing things. And yet they all still made this beautiful hot air balloon. They were all different. Oh, yeah. um, and, and so it, it's, it's that type of that there's so much value that comes from finding different ways to do things. And, you know, it, it's that openness that we need, um, in communication and teams, yeah. um, is, is there, I mean, my gosh, you, you read the book inclusify. I mean, mm-hmm. we're talking six X, the results in a diverse team that get from, from a world massive result. bottom line impact, massive yeah. bottom line impact in diverse teams that are working together to solve problems. Yeah. You have this, um, move towards, I mean, some, some organizations have gone as far to remove job titles and they're just working teams that are, you know, getting, you know, solving these big complex problems, but solving them as a hive or as a, yeah. you know, I, I think that, you know, while drastic, it's still very cool to see, you know, diverse teams working together to solve, you know, complex problems. Um, so the foundation of all of that, though, all of that to go back and sort of tie a bow around it is is com- confidence. And yeah. little girls out of the gate, when we're overly confident, we're loud or boisterous or bossy or, you know, the words that are associated with other Correct. terminologies, you know, um, that, you know, when when men are confident, they're confident. What's what's yeah. another word for a confident man? Just a man. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And so it's 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 that type of thing. And there's another book. Um, 
the name is escaping me, but it's it's all data points um, uh, around you know women in the workplace and really how it starts very very young. Well, um, one of those data points I ran into the other day was that the average man will apply to a job if they meet thirty percent of the criteria of the job description. Thirty percent. Talk mm-hmm. about overconfident and right. the average woman will only apply if they meet 80 percent mm. so that's a that's a scary data point that's a scary da- data point now now let me compliment that data and and frighten you with this other data point yeah. 98 percent of job postings are written with masculine bias so if yeah. a woman will only apply to things that she is 80 percent uh, you know, that's compounded. That applicable to her. That's compounded by the fact that these yeah. job postings don't even speak to her. Yeah, yeah. So I love I love that line of thought, and I'm going to flip to technology. Okay. Um, I love that you're a technologist. I'm not. I'm fascinated by technology, but I've never built a tech stack. Um, and I love the way that you explained it as it's solving lots of different problems. Mm-hmm. Um, one of those problems you just touched on bias in the job description in the job advertisement technology is going to i believe play a much bigger role in solving some of these problems that we can't get out of the way of ourselves we even with the best of intentions we're doing a terrible job of it um where, where are you seeing some exciting evidence of technology playing a role on the team to to overcome these biases or to um improve yeah. uh, access equity in in the in the job process. Yeah, I mean let's get specific. I mean there's tool like a uh, tool like Optimal, Get Optimal, uh, mm-hmm. uh, that is super cool, right? Helping you rewrite, helping you look at all of your sort of foundational evergreen jobs and rewrite them removing um, bias. There are search tools now that can help remove um, anything having to do with age. Any yes. any terminology that would give away gender and any terminology that would, you know, give away level of education or, you know, all of those types of things, um, ethnicity, uh, anything that might um, give an indicator uh, so that you're really looking at a person. I think the thing that still startles me, and I say this all the time, is that, you know, the resume was invented in 1482. Mm -hmm. And, and we're still not past that. And, and so, you know, until we're at a point where, you know, we've really digitized that process, yeah. I mean, really meaningfully digitized it, um, you know, I, I still think that there's, you know, room for error. And, you know, the, the big question, I think Amazon experienced, you know, who's programming Yes, the AI. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, yeah. Which you know, Amazon experienced that in a really negative way. So it's it's being thoughtful, and that is the whole purpose of of inclusivity and diversity is is thoughtfulness. Think about manners, right, uh-huh. and and etiquette. What is the foundation of etiquette? It's acceptance of another culture's traditions and acceptance, acknowledgement and respect for other people's traditions. And I look at diversity, equity and inclusion very much the same. Um, And but there needs to be thoughtful action behind it. And, and so I, I, but all of that on the technology side, there's some very cool things from AI to parsers to, yeah. um, you know, firms that will come in and help you rewrite, um, those job descriptions, um, that are really meaningful. And also, uh, I mean, gosh, we did a, a webinar, um, and I have this idea, I have this, you know, concept of what, what I call a mini stack where you can put uh-huh. a collection of technologies together to solve a bigger problem. So we brought together, uh, Panda Logic, yeah. uh, get optimal, and then hiring solved. And this is the way we look at it. The distribution, the get optimal will fix what's being put out there. Panda logic will help where we distribute it, it ensuring that it goes to diverse you yeah. know, locations um, and diverse, you know, marketing opportunities. Um, and then hiring solve will help you consume that data and then make the best informed diverse decision based on the incoming talent. And so this idea that we can get, and part of that, but let me tell you, it's a hill to climb. 
Yeah. Yeah, it was no small feat to get all of those technology experts together to get them to work together. Play nice. And play nice. Yeah. Uh, but here's the cool thing. There are partnerships building between those technologies now, which I, you know, when I look at how much of an impact can I have on one, you know, one industry, to me yeah. that's making a difference. Just I getting agree. those three technologies to talk, to work together, to integrate. Yeah. I mean, how amazing is that, that we can bring, you know, this this human capital together that as a team came up with this really cool technology to solve a problem. And they're willing to collaborate with more teams to solve it even further, to take the next step. Uh, yeah. And so for me, as you know, one of my superpowers is connect. I'm a connector like that. Uh -huh. I just love doing that. And, and so to be able to be a part of, of that, I think is, that is super meaningful. It's funny the way you described that. I was talking to a, a, a good friend of mine who works at a large technology company and he was suggesting that there's a real, in a large technology company where they've got all of this capability, there's a real bottleneck when it comes to vision and leadership. Hey, we've, we've got this tech, it could do all of these things, but we don't have leaders that are really exploring that because everyone's just heads down surviving you know playing the corporate game and you talked about that at the beginning as far as going out and starting your own consultancy yep. so maybe that's that superpower that you talked about connecting is actually a little bit more maybe it's it's helping create that vision that awareness that drive for for companies for technologies to come together and form a team and i'm intrigued by that i think that's a big ecosystem play um, I think sometimes the, uh, there's a benefit in a stranger or an outsider coming in and creating a, a narrative for how people can work together towards a common goal and not be the, the age old competitors that don't want to share or play nice because they're focusing on, you know, their immediate objectives to get to the next raise or milestone or whatever that might be. Yeah. Uh, yes. You're, 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 you're spot on that. You know, if you get the right teams together and the right groups yeah. together who, you know, can and this I, I did a, a, an article about ego, you know, uh -huh. um, and and what I think it stands for is easing greatness out. Um, wow. Yeah. And um, I think that we let our egos get in the way. And I, somebody told me this one time. It was Lloyd Sonier. I'll never forget. Uh -huh. He said, you can accomplish anything in life as long as you don't care who gets credit. Um, <laughs> sad. <laughs> sad, but true. But true. Um, and that quote has always stuck with me because it reminds me that I need to get out of myself and think about the problem that we're trying to solve. And when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's not a problem and it's not something that needs to be solved. It's what we should expect. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and, and so if we have come to expect this, how, how do we meet that expectation? And, and yeah. therein lies the, how do we make this happen? Yeah. Um, but yeah, ego gets in the way. Whew. Big time. Big, big time. time. I think we're better at it now than we were 20 years ago. Like I remember 20 years ago, you wouldn't even speak to a competitor. Yeah. When now I think there is more collaboration, co-opetition, whatever you want to call it. Um, but there's still a long way to go. And unfortunately, going back to your point earlier, uh, quite often it's the people who hold the power um, aren't allies. Uh, they're, not, they're not trying to really shift the agenda. They're, they're busy. They're overloaded doing what they're doing. And, and so they don't really have the time to look up and look around and, and think about what, could, what problems could be solved you yeah. know, in, on the fringes, which is where, where the best innovation is going to happen. It's so it's so strange to me because, you know, part of our process is we really want to understand who the organization is first. You know, we want to understand your mission, your vision, your values. We'll go search for them. If we don't find them, we're going to ask about them. Yeah. Um, and because that is so foundationally how you create your differentiators. And then those influence the technology that you would buy. I, and I can't quite I, we're. No, I mean, I can. We're, we're doing a much better job of getting um, agencies to understand that it's that work, that foundational visionary work that's so fundamentally important to yeah. you know, helping make really good business decisions that yeah. reflect who you are. 
Um, and that is something that you would be surprised. You would probably be floored at how many agencies we talk to and we ask about mission and vision and values. And, and those are an afterthought. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I think every business, every segment's suffering through that right now. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's interesting the way that you raise the, the, the values, the purpose, the mission, uh, the behaviors of a company kind of inform the persona of the company and the right technology for its customers and its candidates as well as its employees. That's, I've never thought about like that in that way, but it's, it's a scorecard that you don't often see on the RFP. You don't, you don't really look at how that's being aligned. Um, but it makes sense. I mean, the, the more I run this podcast, the more guests we have on the show, I'm always kicking myself after the show going, wow, that was so brilliant what they said. And often it goes back to just trying to make this as simple and, and understandable as possible for the people who are part of your organization, for your team. Yes. And, and, and aligning technology with, with purpose, values, mission makes, makes total sense. Simplicity is a gift that we stop giving ourselves. Uh, yeah. And that, that, that's something we try and drink simplicity every single day. Uh, and, you know, oftentimes when a customer is coming to us saying, hey, we need this new technology, we're like, OK, tell us tell us what the status quo is today. Show us show us what it is. Yeah. Um, and oftentimes I, I'd say three. Yes, I can say that with confidence. Three out of five of the last tech stack evaluations where we, we were coming in to do an entire potential over, overhaul, like mm -hmm. really come in. You know, look at those mission, vision, and values. Look at the tech stack, where you want to go, where you want to be, what that gap is in between, resources that you have to get there. Yeah. Three out of five of them turned into optimization exercises. So huh. all of that to, to, to say, once you buy it, you yeah. have to adopt it. That's our three pillars are build, change, adopt. Um, yeah. And, and, what I see is the Achilles heel right now for all of this technology is adoption. I agree. Uh, and not just adoption, but real training. Going into some generic library in a configuration that looks nothing like yours creates a disconnect between your end user. And, and, and I can't say enough. Um, people need to know that it relates to them. And it needs to be the way that people consume data today, which is not in 30 minute videos. It's in seven minute videos or short, yeah. you know, shorter. 30 seconds, 60 learning, seconds. 30 yeah. seconds, you know, show me how I get that done here and here and yeah. here. And, and it's got to be relatable. And so all of it, there's one word that all of this can be solved with. And that's empathy, understanding yes being empathetic of the job seeking process and how awful it is. You're seeking out the acceptance of strangers with a piece of paper that was invented in 1482, <laughs> you know? And, and, and so I, I think that we forget the empathy of how hard it is to develop a product empathy with how hard it is to build a business, you know? And, and if we can all, you know, I, I don't know, have our batteries charged with empathy. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we'll have different conversations that are more collaborative, are more team-like. Yes, I like that a lot. Actually, taking it away from the business context, if I think about DIY at home and YouTube, mm -hmm. if I turn on a video and it's 15 minutes and the guy has the world's best tool set and I'm sitting there with a hammer, a saw, and a screwdriver, I can't help. You know, right. It doesn't help me. I'm not going to stick in it. But if it's a guy that looks like me, kind of awkward, hasn't got the best tools. And he's like, here's the quick way that I found to fix it. I'm all, yes. like, all about it. Yeah. And it's a three minute video. You're like yeah. all day long. Let me, yeah. and let me go subscribe to his channel. Totally. Right? <laughs> um, so that's, that's what I'm talking about. Like think about your end user, think about, and think about the consumerization of our industry. Yeah. Um, we talk a lot about that. And I think, you know, if, if we're talking about, you know, building teams, it's, it's about awareness. Yeah. Um, teams need to be aware that consumerization is now enter entered in the job market. The way that we respond, you know, at, at the response, you, you, you know, bots are flying off the shelves right now because now there's this sort of level expectation that I go to your site and I have a bot. Yes. Um, 
Because when I go to Amazon, I have a bot. And when I go to Best Buy, I have a bot. When I go here, I have, you know, I go to the bank, I have a bot. I go to Verizon, you know. And so we're consumers. And we spent two years at home consuming. (laughs) Yeah, we got really stuck on it, didn't we? really good at it. It's funny. I was was ordering food last night and I got onto DoorDash and I started ordering it. And then I realized that I had the wrong address in there because I'd ordered food for a friend. Um, And... I wasn't able to change it quickly. So I jumped over to Uber Eats and I bought it from Uber Eats. And I kind of feel that way about some of our recruiters and technology. If they can't quickly fix the problem, they find a workaround. And it's pretty scary to think how many workarounds there are because people have got so used to good technology um, that's just quick and simple and easy. I can quantify it for you. I can tell you, you know, when there wasn't a good process, um, you know, and I was in my corporate life, I had over a half a million dollars in ancillary workaround spent. Wow. Half a million dollars a in people buying little product here and there on their credit cards and expensing it across a global organization. A half a yeah. million dollars in just little nine ninety nine a month and ten ninety nine and twelve ninety nine and you know for for this little fix or that little fix. A half yeah. a million dollars in what we call rogue spend. Uh, yeah. Ouch. That hurts. And uh-huh. then just think about not only the lost dollars but the efficiency, the learning. The, the process yes. simplification. I mean, wow, that's, that's Where a Where did my impact. data go? You yeah. know, that's the other thing that we don't think about are all of these ancillary conversations being had. Yeah. Where does the data go? Where do I have record of that? I don't. And that, I think, terrifies me more than anything, probably because I'm a consummate control freak. But <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I think everybody in our industry is. But yeah. uh, I think that 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 terrified me more than anything. Um, and I put some uh, research behind it. We lost an average of 60,000 LinkedIn connections by not having one enterprise account. 60,000 a month. A because month. Put, put attrition, put a yeah. 35% attrition on that. Yeah. And all of those people with all of their own individual accounts, right? Um, that's why that one central source of truth and buying um, intelligently has so much value to an organization, not just from an efficiency pr- perspective, but from a profitability perspective. Yeah. And I'll take it one step further. Now, today, You have PE PE firms are coming in and acquiring firms. They are looking at your tech stack. Oh, yeah, they They are. They are looking at your business operation. Yeah. And they are making buying decisions and valuation determinations based on that. And so when you have not cared about something, um, it's going to be reflected in the valuation for your business. I think you're absolutely right. I think... So many firms of the past have relied on relationships and and their people are the biggest asset. And it's not to say that the people aren't the biggest asset, but for a buyer coming in um, that's really looking to scale so they get a return on their investment, the only way they can safely rely on scalability is good technology, good processes. Yeah, great people is important, but if you can't scale those great people, you're stuck, aren't you? You're stuck. You're stuck. And that's why... You know, um, having getting the team together um, to create a culture of change, change acceptance, change excitement, change champions. Um, If you can create an or a a team or an organization that that they they kind of live and breathe and get excited about change, you will have an advantage over any other person that you come up against. Yeah. Yeah. That's something I'd like to dig a little deeper on. I know when we were both together at the SIA gig economy um, and Tim Sanders got up and he was sharing the Toy Story evolution about how it nearly got canned and they they got this team together that just fought through all of these little problems and, and just became really good at a cadence of problem solving. Mm-hmm. Um, that was clearly huge for, for uh, I think it was Pixar at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but how do you how do you bring that environment of change um excitement ability uh to a team when you when you're in there working with the tech stack optimization or new build it starts from the top um (laughs) and so you know uh executive sponsorship is huge right Right. having change be aligning the ability to change to the overarching vision and that's it that's a senior that's an executive's job 
is to yeah. essentially break down the overarching vision to the pieces that you know people feel connected to. Yeah. And um, a manager's job, or at least a leader's job, is to break it down even further. What is that individual's part? And when an individual feels ownership towards that meaningful North Star, the likelihood of them being excited about all of these new things that might be coming in front of them, right? That's that Simon Sinek always says, start with why. Yeah. That the, the vision is the why. Yeah. Um, and, and then tying it back to each individual is where you can create these change champions that are like, absolutely, it's a necessity that we get this tool. And yeah, it's going to be a pain in the keister to get it all, yeah. you know, rolled out and get it all implemented. But I'm super excited because we're working towards that. And that's going to help me work towards my personal goal of, you know, the, the what's in it for me. Yeah. Look, with as much ego that is still out there, the what's in it for me is still king. It's a beast. Yeah. It's a beast. And, and if so, you harness the beast, then I, harness I think, the beast. Yeah, you know everybody wants to be an influencer. Everybody wants the easy button, and and so harness that energy and that excitement by helping them see through to the end. And that is usually where the fear of change comes in. Yeah, and and I use this analogy all the time because I'm terrified of bridges. So yeah. I, I had a, a, a bad event on a bridge over water. Oh, gee. Um, and I passed out while I was driving on the Bay Bridge. It was scary. Um, and uh, yeah, it was very scary. Uh, back in 2015, I was having some cardiovascular issues and and uh, or cardiac issues. And anyway, all of that really helped me understand, you know, what fear is about as I went through, you know, hypnotism and so many different strategies to sort of get over this irrational yep. fear, um, which was really it all had to do with trust. Um, not trusting myself or my body to function the way that it should from one point of the bridge to the other point of the bridge, right? Yep. Creating trust is such a foundational part of you know, creating this environment of change and collaboration. And, and so, you know, getting your change champions excited about that is also about creating them trust that, and, and people fear what they don't know is coming next. And so when yeah. I would come to that sort of pinnacle point of the bridge and I couldn't see anything I'm, I don't know why in my irrational mind, I think the bridge is just going to melt in the middle of it and there's no yeah. other side to it. Right. Um, but uh, it, it's not. And it's about, you know, being able to show, show you the end of the route, show you the end of the bridge. And, and so then the fears can subside, but that all starts with trust. So there's so yeah. many layers to, um, you know, creating an environment that people really want to be in and are excited to be in. Yeah. Which, which going back to your earlier point, which is still that really exciting me is this, if you can tie it into your, your purpose and your values, that's, you're naturally going to build more trust. You've got to think because yeah. people understand it. They can see the end of the bridge. Yeah. Yeah. They see the end of the bridge. Yeah. They can see the mission statement. It's everywhere on your website. One of the things that one of my former employers did really well, it was select when it was still select. Mm -hmm. You used to get um, a little pen when you could recite the mission, the vision, and the values. And, yes. and, and you got this little gold pin and I, I, I would see it on somebody's lapel and I'm like, I gotta have a pin. Like, and I would sit there and memorize every, so that when, and it was really random as to how they would choose, you know, who got to recite them yeah. um, at these, you know, big meetings. That's so and cool. so they would just randomly choose somebody and you'd get your gold pin um, to recite the mission, the vision and the value. Oh my God. I would just sit there every meeting, like waiting for my, like, when's somebody going to ask me? me? You know? That's, that's uh, <laughs> awesome early gamification right yes. there. Yes, it was just, and it's those little, I created a training program one time where everybody got a little uh, like Favicon next to their signature when they completed uh -huh. the, you know, the, uh, their trainings. So, yeah. and, because everybody wanted flair, <laughs> yeah. everybody wanted the flair next to their name and they got a little LinkedIn logo when they did the LinkedIn training and a little Indeed logo. And they, you know, it got, and it went off like gangbusters cause we yeah. tuned in and we listened to what excited people and what excited people was learning, but having a carrot at the end of it. Um, yeah. and so it's just, you know, you gotta, in order to, to, you know, you got to seek to understand before you seek to be understood. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's funny on the cynic piece that you mentioned about start with the why. 
a good friend of mine always says he thinks Sinek's got it wrong. He thinks the why is really important. But if you start with the who, going back to your point about understanding the what's in it for me and, mm -hmm. and showing them the end of the bridge, if you start with the who, then it's going to be easier to tell them the why with the right language. Because he's not saying the why is not important. It's like, how do you shape the why to the language of who's going to be impacted by the change or driving the change? Yes. Um, well, I have an entirely, like, I could have a, an entire podcast conversation on Sinek. And yeah. there are things that I think he gets right. And then things where I think just privilege has been such, you know, a, <laughs> we're yeah. like, we're not talking the same language here, buddy. Um, yeah. and, and so, uh, I, I, yeah, I think he gets so many things right, but I, I think that there are, there are points to challenge probably. There's variations. Every author. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, author. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. No, this has been really cool, Lauren. I, um, have learned a lot more about technology from a philosophy, from a philosophy standpoint, as well as D and I, um, which has been wonderful. I think if I summarize some of the points that we touched on, I loved, I love that that the fact that the teamwork, the the Lady Leaders Book Club came together around solving problems. I think that's a great story for teamwork, and clearly that's a team that's achieving great things. Mm -hmm. um, your story on allyship and that perfect example of standing up and saying, "Hey, that was Lauren's idea, not so and so's." Um, that's a great call to action. The, the discussion around uh, confidence mm -hmm. in, in driving. Um, inclusivity in particular for, for women in their roles, um, entering the workforce, the empathy uh, that you touched on, particularly in how you uh, look at technology to align with people and the values and, and behaviors that they're living by was massive. And uh, on that whole change piece, harnessing the beast, getting the what's in it for me, I think that's that's massive. So So many good tips clearly that you've picked up from from what you've deployed with customers. Yeah, I mean we're like I said, we're having a good time. And yeah. um you know, when it stops being a good time is when I'll stop doing it. <laughs> yeah. Um uh but <laughs> all, all kidding aside, um no, we're we're having a good time and you know, I think that if we we are a people business. We're, yep. We truly are. I mean, where else are you connecting great job? You know, great people with great jobs, or great jobs with great people, right? This mm -hmm. is just such a, it's a buzz. fiercely people-driven, uh, people-driven industry, and I think that we have to be. I, I would. What I would ask for your listeners, for every listener, is for thoughtfulness. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, wake up and, um, you know, the, the practice that changed my life was, you know, a, a, a religious gratitude practice. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've taken it even further, you know, these days and, and it's not, you know, just what I'm grateful for, but you know, what's gone right in the day. Cause as an entrepreneur, man, a lot goes wrong yeah. <laughs> and that, that can tailspin you really quickly. Yeah. So, you know, it's it, creating great teams, creating trust, creating all of the things that we've talked about you know, creates, uh, it, it is about creating connectedness. Yeah. Um, and people want to be connected to something teams mm -hmm. that are achieving great things, feel connected. They feel connected to other people. They feel connected to the mission. They, and so how do you, that's the way that I want your listeners to look at this. How do you have a problem in front of you? How do you create it through, you know, connected practice, connected relationships? I love that. Um, Connected so that's practice. what we try and do is we want to connect with the customer. We want to connect with one another, um, you know, and, and I was a solopreneur for the, for the first year and a half. And so it's been, you know, a, a, a change for me to include other people yeah. uh, and just try and create connection and connection to our pillars, connection to the work that we do. Um, and I have a customer who has the best tagline and this is probably the best way to leave you. Yeah. Uh, it's called make it meaningful. Make it meaningful. And make it meaningful. And I, for I, like when they came to me and they're like, this is our rebrand, uh, um, hello, say uh, that tagline, make it meaningful for me. I, I'm like, I just was like, it's so okay, about connection, isn't it? It's so about connection. Yeah. I was like, just write them a check, whatever they want for that. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> um, whoever came up with that is brilliant. Um, but yeah, make it meaningful. And yeah. if every interaction, you know, you, you can have in a, in a, in a day's time, 
can be meaningful. Uh, well, that's our utopia in a human. Yeah, it is. I, I love that. That's a great point to end on. L- Lauren, if people want to uh, find you to engage Leap Consulting to help with their uh, business and, and tech stacks um, or, 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 you know, listen to the podcast, what are the best ways to, to find you and, and engage your team or, mm-hmm. or your content? Yeah. So I am the goat leader on, on LinkedIn. You lose yeah. a little goat by my name. And, uh, so yes, I'm, I'm Lauren Jones, uh, on LinkedIn. So you can always find me there, but if my in mailbox has gotten too crazy, you can also go to Lauren at leapconsultingsolutions.com or www.leapconsultingsolutions.com or find me on Twitter at Elbuff Jones. Awesome. Lauren, thanks so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure and uh, I'm looking forward to taking some of these ideas back to my team for sure. Awesome. Well, it has been a pleasure talking with you, Dave. Thank you so much for having me. You bet.